Welcome to Downtown Sports, my name is Downtown Stephen Brown, and in today's video, guys, there is a lot of Toronto Maple Leafs news from the last couple of days, especially today, to get to ahead of tomorrow's NHL entry draft. Kyle Dubas had a media availability today, and one of the questions that he was asked was whether or not he was worried if restricted free agent Rasmus Sandin would receive an offer sheet. And to that, he said, if there's going to be an offer sheet, the sooner the better, so we can make the decision and move on. Just to give everyone a bit of a refresher on how offer sheets work, up on the screen right now are the dollar amounts and the corresponding compensation that a team would receive if one of their restricted free agents had an offer sheet submitted to them that they wanted to accept. So let's say Rasmus Sandin got an offer from another team for $2.5 million per season. That team would need to uh, transfer their own second round pick as compensation to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And in that window, when the offer sheet is submitted, the Maple Leafs can't just turn around and trade Rasmus Sandin for more than a second round pick. The only options that they would have in front of them would be to match or not match. Before we look at contract comparables and other numbers, I think it's important to ask why. Why is Rasmus Sandin and his agent putting the Toronto Maple Leafs in this sort of situation? How much money does he really think that he's worth? Well, going back to last year in and around the trade deadline, Rasmus Sandin suffered a knee injury that kept him out for the remainder of the regular season. And then by the time the playoffs rolled around, Jake Muzzin was healthy and playing well against the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Leafs had a left side of Morgan Riley, Muzzin, and Mark Giordano. And Rasmus Sandin was healthy and available to play in that series against the Lightning, but he hadn't played in two or three months, and the Maple Leafs decided that it wasn't a great idea to just throw him back in there. And if you look at who the Maple Leafs have under contract for next year, it's Morgan Riley, Jake Muzzin, and Mark Giordano. And Cap Friendly does have Sandin listed as being able to play the left and the right side. He played the right side a couple of games last year. It didn't necessarily go very well. I'd say it's a bit of a stretch to say that he could play the right side at this point in his career. So if I'm Sandin, I'm 22 years old. There are three guys in Toronto on the left side in front of me. Um, it's not necessarily that I think that I'm worth more money right now, but how do I ever get to that point in my career if there's not necessarily a spot for me in the lineup or a regular one at that? You look at a guy like Lilligren who signs a two-year deal for $1.4 million per season, and everyone wants to make that comparison, but it's not necessarily the same thing. If you look at the right side of Toronto's blue line, they have TJ Brody, they have Justin Hall, and Timothy Lilligren, and Justin Hall could get traded. Timothy Lilligren is going to get an opportunity to play games next year. He's going to get an opportunity to show that he could one day be worth more than $1.4 million. So if you're Sandine and you're not established on that right side, there's three guys in front of you on the left side. How do you make the Toronto Maple Leafs commit to you long term? You could ask for more money because then the team can't really justify not using you or using you sparingly. And that may force their hand to maybe trade somebody else, but... They just re-signed Morgan Riley. They just re-signed Mark Giordano. The only other guy on that left side would be Muzzin, and he's got a full no trade clause. Now, the health of Jake Muzzin is kind of up in the air. He suffered two concussions last year, was out a lot, and from the beginning of the year, never really looked like himself. He suffered a lot of injuries throughout his career. We really don't know what Muzzin is going to be heading into next year, and that's a big question mark, and that's where Rasmus Sandin could just get the bulk of his ice time because Jake Muzzin's just not ready to go. But that's not really the most reassuring. So I can understand why him and his agent are maybe trying to entice an offer sheet, right? Either the Toronto Maple Leafs commit to him long-term and he gets a spot in the lineup if they move on from someone else, or he signs with another team and gets an opportunity to play or forces Toronto to trade him. Either way, it's not necessarily about getting the most money possible on this contract. It's about getting an opportunity to play so that he can get the most money possible on his next contract or even the next one afterwards. If you're the Maple Leafs, you should always play hardball in this scenario because the difference between him signing for $2 million and $1.5 million a season is 500 grand. And that may not sound like a lot, especially at the beginning of the season, but come the trade deadline, that could be the difference between acquiring an impact player and not. It could be the difference between um, having a decent fourth liner and someone signed for a league minimum. It could be the difference between having an extra bench player at some point throughout the regular season so that you're not burning out guys who maybe need a day off here and there. Um, it's a cap world, it's a flat cap world, and every dollar matters. That's the long answer. The short answer is that this response is extremely crude. 
especially because Rasmus Sandin is worth way more than just a second or a third round pick. If the Maple Leafs were really worried about an offer sheet, I think we would be hearing more trade rumors involving Rasmus Sandin than what we are. And I don't think there's been any unless I've missed them. Um, I just don't think that there's an offer sheet coming. Up on the screen right now is a list of defensemen who are 23 years old or younger who have finished their entry-level deals and signed their second contracts. So if you're looking at a Rasmus Sandin comparable here, there is Adam Bokfist and Henry Yokiharyu at about $2.5 million per, but then it dips off to around $1.5 million with Huso Velimaki and Timothy Lilligren. And if we're comparing Rasmus Sandin to Yoki Haru or Adam Bokfist, Sandin may have the best advanced analytics, but when it comes to contract negotiations, especially at their age, the number of points in games played, just the counting stats, matter. And Yoki Haru's played almost three times as many games. He's almost two times as many points. And a similar thing with Adam Bokfist here. I just don't really see them as comparables. Also, the contracts that Bogfist and Yoki Haru signed are three years in length. If the Maple Leafs are offering Sandin a two-year deal, an extra year of term is not insignificant at their age, and that is about the difference in the cap hits. Now, this next Kyle Dubas quote from Jonas Siegel, I think, ties into another one, so let's talk about this one first. If we need to create cap space to improve our team, I think we know, based on the conversations we've had, that we would be able to move a lot of our players, if needed, for good value or move them along. I think we're in a good spot that way. In the previous video here on the channel, we talked about some players and whether or not the Toronto Maple Leafs should move on from them this offseason. And we talked about William Nylander and Alex Kerfoot, and we mentioned Justin Hall in passing towards the end. But those are three guys that if the Maple Leafs did decide to move on from them, that I would think that they could get good value in return for, obviously in varying degrees. Another player that we talked about in that video was Jake Muzzin. Now, Muzzin carries a $5.625 million cap hit for this year and next year, and he's got a full no trade clause. And I don't know if he has trade value or if he doesn't. If he does, it's probably not very much, and that's all tied to his health, and really only he and the Maple Leafs know the full extent of it. But the Chicago Blackhawks were able to trade Duncan Keith in what was effectively a cap dump, with two years remaining at $5.5 million to the Edmonton Oilers, and they didn't have to give up anything to do that. And if I had to describe both players at this point in their careers, they're two guys who had a reputation, but are past their primes. A guy that fits into that move them along category is more than likely Peter Morazic. I know there was that segment on 32 Thoughts during one of the intermissions midway through the year where Jeff Merrick said that there would be a market for Peter Morazic and that he would have value in a trade, but I just, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it at this point. I think that the Maple Leafs are going to have to give up some assets in order to move this guy out. If you're acquiring picks and prospects by trading certain players away and then using those picks and prospects to move others along, cap space is an asset and ends up all working out equal if you're going to use the cap space to sign for agents who then could hopefully hypothetically have a positive impact on your team. If it's going to cost the Maple Leafs anything more than a second and a mid to lower level prospect to trade Peter Morazic away in a cap dump, I say they just buy him out themselves. Because just like with the Nick Ritchie situation and what I was saying back then, the cost to trade him away shouldn't be based on what his contract is and his cap hit is right now. It should be based on the cost to buy him out. If the other team that acquires him doesn't want to buy him out, then obviously they feel that he has some sort of value. And then at that point, why are the Maple Leafs paying more for a guy who another team thinks has value? The Maple Leafs paid a second or a third round pick to dump Nick Ritchie's contract, but they also got back Ilya Labushkin in that trade, who played a decent role on the Toronto Blue Line in the regular season and in the playoffs against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And that taker could very well be the Chicago Blackhawks, with Kyle Davidson having said that the Blackhawks will get a much better handle on their goaltending plan for next season over the next 48 hours. Because if you remember back to in and around the trade deadline, there was a deal rumored to be on the table that would have saw the Maple Leafs and the Blackhawks swap goalies. Peter Morazic going to the Blackhawks, Mark andre Fleury coming to the Toronto Maple Leafs, but Kyle Dubas immediately shut that down as soon as the Blackhawks asked for Matthew Nyes in the deal. And speaking of Marc-Andre Fleury, Elliot Friedman, in one of the recent editions of 32 Thoughts, 
said that the Leafs could be interested and in on him come free agency. On the screen right now is a list of goalies who were 35 years of age or older and who played at least 10 games in the NHL last season. It's not a very long list, and there's not very many starting goalies here either. It's really just Marc-Andre Fleury, Jonathan Quick, and Mike Smith. And Fleury and Jonathan Quick didn't sign those deals recently. The contract that Fleury's currently on that's expiring was signed three years ago, and Jonathan Quick's deal was signed uh, forever ago. If I had to guess how much money Marc-Andre Fleury would cost the Toronto Maple Leafs in free agency, based on the comparables, I would say somewhere between Jonathan Quick at $5.8 million and Mike Smith at $2.2 million. And after just having made it to the Western Conference Finals, it was strange that the Oilers already announced like a couple of weeks ago that Mike Smith would be placed on LTIR for the remainder of this contract. He's effectively retired without having retired. Because if he does actually retire, then he won't be entitled to the $2.5 million that he still owed. It's almost like he signed a one-year deal for $4.4 million, but they added a second year onto the contract to be able to spread the money out and have a lower cap hit. So with what looks like some cap circumvention going on here, again, if I had to guess how much money Marc-Andre Fleury would cost the Toronto Maple Leafs and for agency, I'd say somewhere between Mike Smith and Jonathan Quick. But hey, for a guy who's going to be 38 in November and has a family, maybe money isn't his first priority. So who knows? It could be less. I'm not saying between $4.4 million and $5.8 million. I'm saying that they could technically do the exact same thing that the Oilers did with Mike Smith. So it still could be technically seen as me saying between $2.2 and $5.8 million. I'm also not saying that Mike Smith isn't really injured. I'm more so saying that you could probably find a legitimate excuse for most guys in the NHL to just sit out for an entire year, and it would be believable. Hockey's a really rough game. Now, whether or not Flurry would be worth between 2.2, I mean 4.4 and $5.8 million on a contract next year, if we're taking a look at his numbers from last year at 5 on 5, and excuse the bit of randomness with the names here, I already had this chart made up with his stats split between Chicago and Minnesota, so we're just going to reuse it here. Playing for the Blackhawks, who weren't very good defensively in front of him, Flurry was just okay. But when he got to the Minnesota Wild, who were very stingy in front of him, in just 11 games, Flurry's numbers improved a lot. And I don't think the Maple Leafs are quite as good as the Minnesota Wild defensively, but they're definitely better than the Chicago Blackhawks. So, uh, Marc-Andre Fleury is still an NHL goalie. I would still expect him to put up some decent numbers, but I would not expect him to be a clear-cut number one goalie that could play 55 and 60 games next year. I think no matter who the Maple Leafs acquire, I think they're going to have to go out and get two guys regardless. At this point, I really don't know how long this video is, probably uh, too long, because I'm going to have to do another video, uh, because tonight is the draft. I was planning originally to do a video on uh, who the Maple Leafs should select or who's available. I talked to a couple of different guys in the scouting community, a friend that works for an OHL team, another that just uh, eats, sleeps, and poops prospects, I guess. But um, it looks like I'm going to have to do that after we find out who the Maple Leafs select in the first round, or if they even select in the first round. Um, I apologize for the lack of content again on the channel. I'm getting acclimated to working 30 to 40 hours a week at TSN. My internship had just started there. Um, so as I learn to better manage my time, we will see uh, more frequent videos here on the channel. And over the next couple of weeks, I would expect um, more content than what we've had in the last month or so, just because um, there's a lot of news and stuff going on. So uh, even if I'm very tired and it's very late like it is right now, I will still... I turn on the camera and make a video just because I love doing this. So thank you very much for watching. Make sure to like the video if you did like it and subscribe for more because more is always on the way. And guys, I'll see you in the next one.